Uh, I am Stuart, well, I'll do the introduction. I'm Stuart Baker, right? Uh, uh, recently at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, before that looking at uh, WMD intelligence in Iraq and how we screwed that up. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, something I thought that was well in my past, I would have been general counsel of the National Security Agency, uh, and mostly I practice law. So um, I, people ask, are you going to go back into government? And I said, the only, the only one job I would go back to government for, and that is chief privacy skeptic. Uh, uh, and you will see why uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, why I think privacy and privacy laws are as bad as they turn out to be. And, and, and my thesis is they almost always do turn out to be bad. And I have been sort of thinking about privacy issues and privacy laws and, and scandals. And it seems to me that, that what is going on with uh, privacy these days is a series of moral panics about privacy. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to talk about the beginnings of privacy law and the privacy movement and then how it has turned into a kind of uh, moral panic machine. So um, let's start with the beginnings of privacy law and the whole privacy movement, which as everybody knows is uh, uh, Justice Brandeis's uh, seminal article in 1890 when he talked about the right to privacy, well, invented it more or less, uh, uh, and it's often genuflected to, and really, and it's better genuflecting than reading, uh, and that has led me to ask a question uh, to which I believe there is an answer, uh, and that question is, was Louis Brandeis just a snob or a wuss, or both? Uh, and if you read this article, and you really should, because it tells you a lot about the origins of the privacy movement, you'll see that there's a lot of evidence for both of those things. Is he a snob? Yeah, he says, uh, uh, what does he say? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, indolent are being... Uh, distracted with all this idle gossip uh, uh, from the important work that they should be doing. Uh, or uh, little wonder that the ignorant and thoughtless mistake the relative importance of the high-minded journalism we give them and the gossip that they keep reading about me. Uh, and uh, so there's clearly a heavy element of snobbery in this initial privacy uh, 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 article, but wussery abounds as well. Uh, he, I, he is, he talks about how uh, uh, privacy has become so much more important as, as man has become more refined, and that the uh, refinery of, uh, of, of people uh, such as himself has made it even more painful to have your privacy intruded upon. It's, uh, it's more painful than, uh, uh, far greater than would be inflicted by mere bodily injury. He's so sensitive about these intrusions into his privacy. So you, you ask, what is this invention? What is this innovation that he says has produced these terrible results? Well, it's a $25 Kodak camera, which was invented right around the time he wrote this article uh, and brought, uh, 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 made it possible for anybody to take a picture. And he hated this. He said, uh, not just that's my bad side, but you shouldn't be taking my picture. If I wanted my picture taken, I'd have somebody, you know, uh, uh, paint my portrait. Uh, and the loss of control over his own image is the privacy invasion that has led him to create this entire movement and, and seek to create a new right which would be uh, recognized in common law, the right to control your image against those people engaged in idle gossip uh, and to protect you from a pain worse than physical injury. Uh, so, I'd like to go back to the question of what is Louis Brandeis, and I, I think we should, we should once again let him speak for himself. Hey, you kids, get off of the lawn. Get off of my lawn. I, that's it. I, he's a fogey. He, he is afraid of this new technology and determined that it should not intrude on the, his, you know, the second half of his life. Uh, and I, uh, my theory is that 
Fogeyhood is at the heart of most of the privacy movement that we see today. And I'm going to try to defend that thesis uh, after I've talked a little bit about moral panic and how to recognize them. And I think at the connection to uh, uh, modern privacy scandals will be obvious. Now, everybody knows what a uh, moral panic is. I assume uh, the classic is uh, witch hunting in Salem or across Europe, burning them at the, cro at the uh, stake. Uh, uh, essentially, in times of great turmoil and fear that uh, uh, moral standards are being eroded, social standards are being eroded, uh, there's a desire to find the villain find the witch, point her out, and burn her. Uh, and uh, moral panics recede, but they leave a lot of damage in their wake. And so I'll just talk about a few moral panics that the United States has gone through. Uh, uh, it begins, and these are the stages, the classic stages of a moral panic, with a kind of unease on the part of um, uh, the powers that be, a sense that there's change afoot that they don't like. It's technological change, maybe, or it's social change, it's immigration, uh, the assumption that teetotaling and uh, abstinence from alcohol was the morally correct cause uh, is being challenged by new immigrant groups that don't have any of those uh, uh, moral qualms about the use of alcohol, or new technologies are I can't believe this, but there were parents who believed that it was bad for their kids to be dragged away from vegetating in front of the TV the way they did, and instead going out and shooting zombies on their, uh, uh, on their computers. But it is change, and people don't quite know what's going on, and they get uneasy about it, and then they start to see that this change is not just contained, that it is growing, and there's a possibility that their sense of the world will be overturned by people who don't share their current values. And that leads to a sort of media frenzy in which the terrible acts, uh, the, the, the unease about uh, video games, the unease about drinking, turns into a media campaign to say uh, bad things are afoot, eight-year-old boys are killing caregivers after playing uh, video games, uh, uh, it's driving them crazy, and before you know it, You've got your witch. You've got your folk devil. You can say, it's those video game guys. Yesterday, it just seemed like a guy who had a tech job and lived in the neighborhood. But now we know he's the devil incarnate. He is seducing our children. Or it's a guy who occasionally drinks too much. Now we know uh, he is evil. Uh, and that you know, leads on to a desire to say, while we still hold the majority, let's make changes in the law to reflect our moral judgments, to punish those evil devils, those witches, uh, and to show that the world is going to remain the way that we want the world to remain. Uh, uh, we will uh, institute prohibition. We will ban video games or restrict video games. Uh, and remarkably, these laws don't actually change the social uh, movements uh, that, uh, or the social change that they are aimed at. Uh, people keep drinking, they keep playing video games, and the people who do the drinking and do the video games start voting uh, and voting their preferences, uh, which is not to keep these harsh laws in place. And before you know it, we've got the morning after, we wake up and say, what were we so worried about? Uh, I'm killing zombies now, uh, and I'm having a drink uh, uh, in the evening, and the world has not ended. Uh, and we wonder, what could those people possibly have been thinking? That is the classic moral panic. Uh, and the connection to uh, uh, privacy movements uh, I, I, is something I want to explore. But first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the bad news that comes with this, because um, we don't always just repeal these laws. Uh, and the effect on law, I'm a lawyer and, and I am troubled by the way in which our laws are distorted by these moral panics. Uh, and let me give you two or three things that I think are particularly bad about laws derived from moral panics. First, it's, re it's, it's a kind of remarkable uh, how determined people are. If they really believe they're right, and they think that the people who are voting against them, evading the law, are wrong, 
they are willing to punish those people extraordinarily harshly in order to restore the moral order that they saw 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the most astonishing thing, and I, 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 it, this has been sort of suppressed in our history, uh, uh, in order to make sure that industrial alcohol was not diverted to uh, uh, human consumption, uh, the U.S. government poisoned it all so that uh, if you drank it, you went blind and died. Uh, tens of thousands of people went blind and died. And the U.S. government's position was it's their own damn fault. They shouldn't have been drinking. I, it's kind of astonishing now that, that, that we would say we, so, we, we are, have so demonized those folks that we are willing to engage in that kind of mass uh, punishment uh, and almost never makes sense. Despite all of that, as I said, the trends that led to the moral panic, a sense we're losing control, actually result in a loss of control for the people who believed in the things that they uh, uh, instantiated in law. Uh, and the law ceases to reflect the will of the majority, but it's still on the books for reasons I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and so how do we respond to laws that don't really make sense anymore to us? Well, we start selectively enforcing them. We don't enforce them against cute little flapper girls who are carrying flasks. Uh, we only go after uh, you know, uh, uh, workers who drink too obviously in local, uh, uh, locales. Uh, uh, and so it becomes a tool in which you can be reasonably sure that if you've got enough money, you've got enough prestige, uh, or you're cute enough, uh, you're not going to be prosecuted uh, under this law. But if you somehow piss off the authorities, they've got a ready instrument, because everybody has alcohol at home, so everybody can be prosecuted. Uh, I, and the, the idea that, that you have a citizenry that lives on the assumption that at any moment uh, their government can put them in jail uh, it, that is a fundamentally uh, unhealthy uh, social relationship in a democracy to have with your government. So selective enforcement is very dangerous and it's almost inevitable as a result of uh, the, the kinds of laws you get from moral panics. And then finally, uh, related to that is it turns out that there's something valuable about the law. Not the original goal, but if you're a bootlegger, you really want prohibition to stick around. So you will spend money, and there, and there were Baptist bootlegger coalitions to keep uh, prohibition in states. Uh, uh, the Baptists believed in it, and the bootleggers were making money off it. And so um, the laws start to serve unrelated uh, interests that uh, are built on power relationships. Powerful, privileged people end up uh, uh, getting the benefit of these laws and the rest of us don't even know they're in, in effect. Uh, uh, also not a good uh, uh, outcome if you believe in democracy and equality before the law. So that's moral panics. Let's talk a little bit about privacy uh, uh, moral panics and the laws that they have produced. And I want to go back to Louis Brandeis. You know, he hated that uh, Kodak camera for 25 bucks. Uh, uh, when he wrote that article in 1890, there were about a million pictures in the world that had been taken, ever. Uh, and by 1901, uh, the price of a Kodak camera had dropped to a dollar, uh, so uh, the hoi polloi were, uh, uh, were gaining on uh, uh, the justice. Uh, uh, and uh, by 1901, there were about two million pictures that had been taken in the world. So how's he doing in his movement to stamp out uh, uh, illicit photograph taking? Well, today, um, 900 million pictures taken. That's today, like today. Uh, and today put online. Uh, so he's lost the fight. Nobody, there are still people you know, who, who would prefer not to be photographed, but we have lost the idea that we have some permanent right not to be photographed. Uh, we've just learned to live with it, and this is what happens with privacy invasions all the time. Yes, it's shocking the first time you realize your nose is that big. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, you see a few more, 
and you get used to it, and you realize, you know, uh, uh, your, your wife married you anyway, uh, so this must be what you look like. Uh, and, and so you stop worrying about it. It doesn't feel like a privacy intrusion the 20th time your picture goes online. Uh, uh, and, and that is the problem with privacy laws generally. They erode very fast. The consensus that leads to them erodes as people have kind of experience with the technology, uh, uh, and, uh, and the law lingers on. And indeed, Remarkably, Justice Brandeis's law, which he sold to judges across the country and to legislatures across the country, is still in place. So here's a typical uh, sample of recent privacy awards for violating Justice Brandeis's uh, uh, right to privacy. Everybody knows who this is, right? Uh, on the right is, have I, have, I, have I missed my demographic? Uh, that's right, that's Dustin, that, uh, that's Dustin Hoffman, and then in the middle, Bette Midler, right, uh, and on the left, Vic, excellent, yes. Okay, so what is it about those people uh, and their privacy? How much privacy do they have? Everybody in this audience knows who they are. They've seen pictures of them all the time. These are, these are the, oh, the, but they won those amounts of money because somebody took their picture in an unauthorized way. They are living in Justice Brandeis's world. The rest of us aren't. Uh, and, and, and yet, who are these people? These are the, the, the folks who have most relentlessly sold their privacy to the highest bidder. They live to have their privacy invaded. Uh, and they have, come, they have taken a law de designed to prevent privacy invasions and enabled people to make boatloads of money by selling their images uh, rather than uh, uh, protecting privacy. This is an example of the way in which privacy laws, once they lose their foundation in uh, genuine, uh, genuine sense of invasion, turn into something else. And in this case, it turns out that if you have enough lawyers and you care enough about commercializing this, you can still get money from people for violating your privacy, or your quote privacy, uh, uh, and nobody else lives in that world. Uh, this has nothing to do, I think, with uh, what was intended when this law was passed. And this is not uh, untypical. Let's, let's try another more recent privacy panic. Uh, um, Gmail users, how many people here use G Gmail? Yeah, okay. So when Gmail was first announced, it was about 10 years ago, so it was just when we were getting the uh, Ideas Festival off the ground. Uh, there were about 12 million users. It was in beta, uh, and they announced that they were going to run algorithms against your mail and serve you ads that reflected the interests that were in your mail. And uh, privacy groups uh, announced that, uh, of course, they were going to uh, urge a boycott of Gmail because it was a privacy intrusion. It was, in fact, a wiretap. These were unconsented uh, reading of your email. And then Google said, no, it's just an algorithm. It just looks for keywords and it serves you ads. And, and the privacy group said, no, it's a wiretap. They're reading your mail. Uh, and um, they asked for a boycott. Uh, so how'd they do, 2014? Um, you knew how that was going to end up. So 425 million users, that was actually about a year ago that uh, uh, Google announced that. 425 me million people who said, yeah, fine. I, I understand the difference between reading my mail and running an algorithm against it. Uh, I, and uh, uh, again, what had been a deeply felt moral objection to uh, providing a service on terms of giving up access to the content of your emails uh, now, uh, now feels like just part of the modern world. And the idea that we would ban Gmail would kind of uh, annoy at least 425 million people. Uh, and yet, remarkably, privacy groups are still trying to do this. Uh, there is a lawsuit against Google saying, you know, in some states we have privacy laws against wiretapping that say you have to have the consent of both parties before you can engage in a wiretap, before you can access the content of communications. And maybe the people at, who have accounts at Gmail voluntarily gave up that right, but the people who are sending them mail did not. And so Google is wiretapping 425 million accounts, uh, and it's $10,000 per violation. Uh, even Google cannot afford to lose this case. Uh, and yet the judge said, yeah, 
makes sense to me. Uh, and uh, so that litigation is actually going on right now. The Supreme Court refused to, uh, no, this is a different case, uh, but uh, the case is going on. There's a question whether there's going to be a, um, uh, a class action certified or not. Uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, there is a distinct possibility that we will all be punished by the privacy groups by taking away Gmail, or at least taking away the uh, method for monetizing Gmail that allows us to get all those services for free uh, in order to prove a point that is 10 years out of date, which is that uh, uh, an algorithm should be viewed as the same thing as a wiretap. One last one. Uh, this is from the 70s. The FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, everybody remembers him as an arch villain, and in many ways he was. Uh, I, he, uh, one of the things he did is he had his agents all around the country do clippings files on prominent or interesting or controversial figures uh, and send them to Washington so that when those guys ended up in Washington or ended up under investigation or ended up saying things that J. Edgar Hoover didn't like, he had a whole, he had their entire history in front of them. And so things that they said 30 years ago that were kind of embarrassing, you know, scrapes they got into with the law that are long ago forgotten uh, uh, except for the little clipping uh, all of that was available to him, and he could go into their office and say, don't worry, uh, Senator, your secret is safe with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and by the way, can I talk to you about my budget? Uh, it, so it was, a, it was not a, a, a nice thing. Uh, and there was deep outrage at uh, uh, the FBI conducting clipping searches. Uh, and so the Attorney General said, okay, that's it. The FBI will never do a clipping search will never, never assemble a clippings file on anyone without some law enforcement or other investigative predicate. There must be a basis, there must be an investigation, there must be a reason to assemble this file. Uh, and you will be punished if you gather these clippings without that. So that was in 1975 when clippings files were pretty you know, uh, new to uh, individuals, uh, uh, new to the public. Uh, uh, it's 2014. So, how are we doing protecting ourselves against the evil of people gathering clippings files on us as individuals? Well, you know, again, you're, you're starting to see how this pattern works. Uh, ten, there were 10 million searches in 2014 uh, by name for an individual, and again, an individual. Just one individual uh, got 10 million searches. Anybody who uses Google, oh, you know who it was. Uh, um, Anybody, any nine-year-old girl can assemble a clippings file on anybody in America. But on, in August of 2001, just before the uh, World Trade Center was attacked, uh, uh, an, any nine-year-old girl could assemble a clips file as well. But not a single FBI agent could, do, could use Google and print out the results uh, if they were searching for an individual. We ended up with a law that made sense in 1975, and 25 years later, the only parties who were bound by that, were restricted by that, but were people who were trying to find terrorists uh, uh, and avoid uh, an attack on the United States. Uh, uh, and again, as we've, we've just as we don't like you know, how our nose looks in the photos, there are things in our Google you know, search queue that we, we regret, or you know, if you've lived a life, there are at least. Uh, and and uh, uh, again, we, we hated it the first time we Googled ourselves and we saw that you know, on that first page was what, uh, in my case, tech dirt says about us. Uh, and, and, but it was, you sort of, you get over it. You say, yeah, there, there are people who hate us. There are, uh, there are stupid things I said, uh, and no one's ever going to forget them. And I'm sorry about that, but that's the world. And so the idea that the FBI couldn't do Google searches suddenly makes no sense, even though it made perfect sense just 25 years earlier. Uh, and that, I think, is the problem generally with uh, the way in which we have approached these problems. We get upset about a new technology, it has implications for privacy, and privacy groups understand that we will get less upset over time. And so they want to make us really upset and insist there has to be some legal change which they can lock in uh, even as we stop caring about this and 
unfortunately, that law that they want to lock in, much as they believe in it, is going to have unintended consequences, most of them bad. That's the thesis of this. Uh, let me talk uh, quickly about today's privacy panics and then a little bit about what people should do when they're caught in the middle of uh, privacy panic. Uh, um, three privacy panics that we're watching today. The European Union, uh, uh, their court of justice, uh, remarkably has, has made the most aggressive uh, and activist Supreme Court eras seem tame by just inventing a right to be forgotten, uh, in which, I mean, this is kind of astonishing. You can complain to Google, and the government will back you up, and you'll say, there's a link to an article. I'm not going to ask the people who wrote the article to take it down because they won't, and they, they have a right to put it up. But I don't like it. I think it's out of date, and it's irrelevant to something. Uh, and therefore, I do not want the search engine to tell people about that article. Uh, and the government it will use its power to make Google take that search link out of the queue. Uh, and what the court said was, doesn't matter if it's true, doesn't matter if it's authorized, doesn't matter if the government actually required that it be published originally, we can decide, uh, or actually Google now has to decide when it gets a complaint, uh, to take it down or face fines, investigations, uh, uh, and damages. Uh, uh, and that is happening with respect to Americans, that is happening with respect to the probably 30% of the first uh, uh, week's requests were uh, uh, child sex offenders who thought that uh, you know, their past uh, uh, convictions were uh, um, irrelevant or outdated. Uh, uh, this is censorship on a mass scale of true facts that a lot of people would like to know. Uh, and it's at the instance of governments, just not our government. And yet, the reaction in the United States, the reaction from Congress, the reaction from uh, uh, civil liberties groups is just to dummy up about it. It's, oh, well, that's what foreigners do. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's privacy. You know, it's got to be good. Uh, I, and uh, this is this probably the biggest intrusion on our ability to actually get true information that has been authorized by governments uh, uh, since the uh, Constitution was written. Uh, uh, and no one is doing anything to, to fight it. Uh, um, again, the principal beneficiaries of that in the long run will be the people who have the money and the determination to get something out of this law and probably something other than what we thought. We thought maybe you know, it would make those, those embarrassing photos from uh, our college era go away. But instead, it's going to hide uh, 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 child sex offenders and uh, uh, the French minister's former mistresses from us. So let's talk about a second privacy uh, panic that's underway. The National Security Agency, uh, uh, you only have to say that uh, uh, to uh, have people start saying, yeah, which, 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 right over there. Uh, and the problem uh, here is that, uh, in fact, uh, NSA mostly obeyed the law. Uh, I would say 98% compliance. There's always a few individuals that uh, 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 stretched the law or broke it and were punished. Uh, there really isn't a legal scandal uh, here. There is a, an anxiety over the technology that makes it possible to assemble in one place every phone call, a record of, of, of the uh, billing data, who you called, who called you, how long you talked, uh, uh, what the date was. That information is easily assembled now and easily searched. And it has given us a view into how government can use this data. This data was used, in fact, to close a hole that uh, uh, was demonstrated by 9-11, uh, uh, in which it became clear that we actually had no way. We found a terrorist abroad, and he was getting phone calls. We had no way of knowing uh, whether any of those calls came from the United States, and no way of checking to see who, if there was somebody in the U.S., was conspiring with that person. And in fact, that was true in 9-11, and uh, NSA saw the phone calls and didn't know they came from the United States and couldn't have tracked the guy if they did. Uh, so it's a significant hole. It's not like we're never going to see another 
internationally planned and executed uh, terrorist attack on the United States, at least if ISIS has its way. Uh, and so it's a serious problem, and the only way NSA thought it could deal with that problem, since it couldn't rely on the phone companies to keep this data for any significant length of time or to search it in an easy way to find the context, they said, why don't we just store it, uh, and then we will have strict limits on when we can search it. This so should sound familiar. It's pretty much what Google tells you. Say, yeah, we run algorithms against it, but we don't actually see it. We, don't, we, we, we have it, uh, and we could read it, but we don't. Uh, uh, and we've all learned to live with that with Google. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, NSA program was built on the same assumption that people would cut them the same slack uh, uh, that they cut Google. Uh, Wrong guess. Partly that was because the people who disclosed this information disclosed the fact that it was being collected and then withheld for almost three weeks uh, the, all the restrictions on doing the searches while the narrative was uh, cemented that NSA was just scooping it up and spying on all Americans. Uh, so it's a bad story, but it has turned into a uh, persistent determination uh, derived from fear of mass collection, uh, big data, uh, to trying to just say whatever NSA is doing, it's probably bad and we should stop it. Uh, and so there are two or three laws, including a law that is likely to pass that is going to abolish this program and put in its place something that is substantially less likely to be effective in an emergency. Uh, um, and blinded, I would say, by hostility and a moral panic over big data and government access to large quantities of data. Uh, we're not having a debate about the best, best way to control government use of that data. We're just saying, which, 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 let's stop them. Uh, and we'll regret that law, I believe, uh, just as we will have regretted the others. Um, Last uh, uh, privacy crisis or uh, moral panic that we're going through has to do with information sharing. Uh, there, is a, there is a very substantial authoritarian government threat to everybody in this uh, um, audience and uh, most large companies and anyone who engages in dissent from government policies. It's not U.S. government policies, and it's not a U.S. government threat, but the People's Liberation Army will break into your computer if you are quoted in the Chinese press uh, saying something effectively hostile to their government, uh, uh, or if they believe that uh, uh, you have economic interests that uh, if they exploited your, uh, your data, they it would make a Chinese company richer. Uh, the, or if you are campaigning for Tibetan uh, autonomy uh, uh, or religious freedom uh, in China. They will break into your computer, they will steal all the secrets, and they will use them against you if they can. Uh, which means, and they turn on your camera, they turn on your mic, they watch you at your desk, it's the full 1984 package except you had to buy the equipment. Uh, and it's a serious problem. It's, Stopping it requires that we rethink a lot of what we're doing now, because what we're doing now is not working. But one way to stop it, or one effective tool, is as soon as one person realizes that this particular piece of um, mail, or this particular email address, or this particular IP address is associated with that infrastructure of exploitation that the Chinese are using, and I shouldn't pick on the Chinese, the Russians do this, uh, uh, the North Koreans kind of do it, the, the Iranians kind of do it, uh, uh, hell, the Israelis do some of this, uh, and so do the French, uh, uh, and if you're not talking about Americans, uh, uh, we break into computers as well. So this is happening all around the world. It's not good for us as a country uh, to have this become a democratized tool of intelligence gathering, but we have to find ways to at least make sure that people who are determined to overcome our military advantages and to impose their system on countries that are currently immune to their interests, uh, their influence, uh, that, that we can protect them. And that means making sure that every time one person finds one of those pieces of infrastructure, uh, that they tell everybody else who is at risk 
so that those people can block communications, they can refuse to accept mail, they can refuse to accept attachments that match that profile. That's, and you've got to do that very fast because people change their infrastructure on a daily basis. That means sharing information quickly, which is what we've been hearing about. When you hear people from Washington say, we need information to deal with cybersecurity, this is what they're talking about. The problem with that is there is an old, not so old, 80, the 80s, privacy law, this is a theme, uh, which says, uh, you know, we just think as a precaution, you should, if you're in the electronic services business, you should never give information about your customers to the government without a subpoena, which sounded pretty reasonable at the time. But now when you're talking about saying you need to provide that stuff on an hourly or a daily basis every day, and it turns out that if you're an ISP and you've got a bad IP address on, you know, somebody has broken into a computer on your net, on, that, that you provide services for and is using it to store stolen information from all, all around the country, that's your customer. So if you tell people, by the way, this, is, this guy is doing bad things, he's stealing information from all around the country, you're providing information about your customer. Where's the subpoena? There is no subpoena, so they're not going to provide the information, which means that we have an enormous hole in our inf information sharing infrastructure, which uh, CISPA, the uh, uh, Comprehensive Immigration or Information Sharing and Privacy Act, I think, uh, um, uh, was designed to authorize for certain purposes with lots of protections against misuse of the information for criminal investigative purposes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it has been turned into a privacy Armageddon by privacy groups and industry. It really is the industrial privacy complex. Uh, uh, all of Silicon Valley has decided to start funding privacy groups to fight anything that authorizes additional government uh, uh, power, even in areas like this, uh, where it would make us all uh, uh, safer uh, from genuine privacy intrusions. So uh, an ongoing privacy um, uh, uh, moral panic. So I have, um, this is the last point on this, uh, I have decided that I will dramatize my view that uh, there are moral panics and dumb consequences from privacy laws everywhere by awarding every year a dubious achievements in privacy law uh, award to people. Uh, and uh, naturally, we call them the privies, uh, and we, we have a beautiful golden uh, icon that we uh, award. No one has actually showed up to claim it yet. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see this online. Uh, category one is privacy hypocrite of the year. It was oversubscribed. Um, uh, we all got to serve someone uh, uh, the uh, worst use of privacy law to serve power and privilege. Uh, there were a lot of uh, great candidates for this. My favorite is, again, the uh, uh, People's Republic of China, which has discovered that if you want to punish dissent or people who are investigating corrupt officials, punish them for, for uh, unauthorized access to the personal information of the officials that they are investigating, and even the Europeans will say, well, that doesn't sound like oppression, that sounds like our privacy law, and it does, because it is. Um, and uh, the dumbest privacy cases of the year, including uh, this one was the uh, Boston Police Department, uh, somebody called up uh, uh, to complain about uh, uh, the way they'd been treated by the police, uh, recorded the conversation, put it on their website to show how they'd been treated by the police. Uh, Boston had two choices. They could have said, yeah, that was a bad thing that that person said to you. Or they could say, you know, that's a wiretap. You didn't have two-person consent for that. Well, they chose the second. Um, this is where you would go if you wanted to read more about that. Let me finish with a quick tour for those who are facing privacy panics. When you're on the receiving end of which, which, which. Uh, uh, and I, I wanted to get to this in part because we have to acknowledge that you've got to treat the people who are saying that with respect, uh, even though I have made fun of them. I, uh, the fact is that we're all uh, subject to this kind of panic. We're all fogies at heart. We're all Luddites. We, we would like to get the benefits of technology and not the uncomfortable aspects of it. And we are disoriented by uh, technical change. Uh, uh, and, and so it's not surprising that people don't like the things they see uh, and that they react with uh, hostility to changes uh, uh, and uh, 
uh, a concern about their privacy. Those are perfectly legitimate concerns. Uh, the problem is the unintended consequences of trying to enact the equivalent of table manners. Uh, um, a, so if you're on the receiving end of this, well, you've got to remember that time is on your side, that if, if you manage to handle this properly and you introduce people to these changes so they can get used to them, uh, you're likely to win. If you can give them something instead of taking their privacy from them, the, there's an enormous difference between an ISP saying, we're going to start, on, uh, you know, next month we're going to start collecting all the websites you visit so that we can serve you better ads, um, a, which is going to, would create a privacy storm, and saying, you know, if you'd like 25 bucks off your monthly bill in exchange for us collecting this information and serving these ads, uh, we're, we're, it's a free offer. Uh, I, all the difference in the world. Uh, one is a privacy scandal and the other is a commercial offer. But in the end, most of us would take that deal. And after a year or two, when nothing really bad had happened, the people uh, who hadn't taken that deal would start to realize that they were just paying $25 a month extra for uh, something of dubious value. Uh, I would also suggest, though, if you're thinking about getting into this business, uh, there is really a second-to-market uh, advantage here. Let the first guy fling himself out of the trench and fall on the barbed wire so that you can step on him and jump to the next trench. Uh, I, and that is, uh, uh, by and large, how most of these um, privacy scandals have ended uh, with the second person coming through and tinkering with what got the first guy in trouble. And yet you need a, a, an exit strategy for selling out, finding a, a, a way to back off of the, uh, of the business model you've chosen. Um, Notice and consent, for those of you who are in this, I, 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 it's a unsatisfying to everybody to, to put this stuff in your uh, uh, terms of service because so few people read it. Uh, but somebody does, and it usually ends up getting you uh, bad publicity. But if you want to be able to say, look, this is a commercial offer, you take it or not, uh, I, I, it underwrites the cost of my service, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, insisting on this. Uh, uh, it is a the best defense against the kinds of litigation that you're going to uh, uh, see, but you've got to be brutally candid with people about exactly how you're going to use this information, and one reason that Google's in trouble uh, is they were not brutally candid about exactly how they were uh, uh, running ads against uh, uh, the content of uh, Gmail. Uh, and then lastly, something, this is a, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Michael Chertoff, who was uh, the Secretary of uh, uh, Homeland Security, with me, uh, um, a, I think the only time he looked at me as though he envied me was when I won an award from Privacy International uh, as the worst public official of 2007, uh, uh, beating out uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, among other things. I, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, and, and because he never let people make privacy claims about the Department of Homeland Security without taking those, those seriously, giving them the respect of, of an actual response and a defense that shows what the value of those programs is, whether you're talking about TSA or the gathering of everybody's, everybody's travel data at the border, uh, which we've been doing since 2002. Uh, um, a, and uh, uh, it had enormous value as a counterterrorism uh, 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 measure. Uh, and we just showed up everywhere and talked to the press every time that issue was raised. Uh, so people understood this wasn't just a willful invasion of their privacy, it was an effort to do something that a lot of people value. And what I find is that uh, there are a substantial number of people uh, who really, really hate these intrusions into their privacy and co are convinced that government is doing the wrong thing with that data. Uh, in the second term of a Democratic uh, administration, there's always more Republicans who feel that way, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so you always have somebody who will say that, who's politically respectable. Uh, but the vast majority of Americans, the center of the country, uh, feels about most of these programs, I'm willing to trade this theoretical privacy for the concrete benefits that I'm being offered if I understand what those concrete benefits are. Uh, and so uh, uh, 
my view is you have to stand up and you have to confront those uh, uh, charges uh, as early as, and as often as possible, which is kind of why I'm here. So uh, that's the end. Why don't I take questions? If I have not gotten somebody mad enough to want to make a speech, I've really failed. Yes, sir. You haven't. Ah. <laughs> you haven't failed. <laughs> All right. Well, short speeches, please, and, and end with a question. <laughs> uh, well, I really, I'll, I'll try to do, do my concerns in, in, in question form, which are, right. uh, do you, you don't really draw the line much in your discussion between what Google, which is a private company, might be doing. Um, and what the United States government does. Yes, I, I, I do, but I, I, I take your point. And it seems to me that the answer that NSA gave, which was, well, we could if we wanted to read all your messages, but trust us, we're the government, we don't do that, or we don't do it to you, we might do it to somebody else, may not be totally satisfactory to Justice Brandeis, uh, may not be totally satisfactory under the Fourth Amendment, and candidly, hasn't been totally satisfactorily addressed by you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to talk about that. And uh, second, well, let me okay. ask the second part of it, which is, how do you define, even for celebrities, the uh, zone of reasonable expectation of privacy that perhaps we all have? It's one thing to take a picture of a television screen with Vanna White on it. It might be another thing to take a camera and shoot it through her bedroom window. Yeah, OK. So. Uh, uh, that's, that's a harder one. I'll put that off, and I'll make you tell me again at the end. Uh, let, me, let me start with the difference between the U.S. government and Google and the difference between having the information and not looking at it and having the information and looking at it. Uh, uh, it is true that um, uh, and, uh, the ACLU will always stand up and say, well, Google can't come to your house and arrest you and take you to jail. Uh, this is true. But it is not Google's job to prevent you from being blown up by terrorists either. Uh, the government has greater powers precisely because it has responsibilities that are more important to us as individuals. So the idea that, that we can just let Google have it because you know, they, they they're no threat is ignores the other side of the ledger. Uh, second, um, it, it is not just the fact that uh, uh, NSA said, well, trust us, you know, come on, we're Americans. Uh, in fact, uh, the program was built with almost every available oversight mechanism that could have been designed by a cynic about uh, how intelligence operates. That is to say, uh, that program was endorsed by and reviewed by presidents of very different Stripe, I, I, they had executives, uh, uh, people that they appointed who were of very different views, who had oversight authority within the executive branch. The Justice Department um, has substantial authority to uh, 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 investigate and indict uh, NSA officials who uh, act improperly. Uh, on top of that, there are internal NSA uh, uh, offices from the general counsel to the inspector general who have uh, uh, authority to investigate this. I used to say when I was at NSA, there were at least five people whose careers would be made if they could catch us doing something wrong. Uh, and now it's like 20. Um, a, on top of that, and in contrast to the, uh, the early days of the Cold War, there is oversight from both sides of the aisle in two different uh, houses of Congress, the committee, the intelligence committees, can be read into anything they want. Uh, and unlike any other part of Congress, there is a substantial amount of bipartisanship uh, and bipartisan authority so that uh, the, uh, the ability to misuse this in a partisan way is much diminished. Uh, and finally, on top of that, uh, the courts were brought into this to uh, review uh, the legal case for particular uh, um, uh, uh, actions and to oversee the actual implementation of the restrictions that made sure that these employees who the limited number who had access to this uh, uh, database uh, were only looking at uh, justifi making justifiable searches, staying within bounds, and by and large, they were. Uh, so the only thing that didn't happen, now and this is not, this is a big deal, I, I, I grant you, is we didn't say, by the way, this is exactly what we're doing and exactly how it works. But 
look, this is intelligence gathering. The people who care most about exactly what we're doing and exactly how it works are the people we're spying on. Uh, and, and if you t try to tell the American people, you're telling them first. Uh, uh, and you just cannot do intelligence gathering and say our, uh, our solution to, to, to abuses is to disclose all the intelligence operations we're conducting. So that's, that's my overall sense. First, Fourth Amendment, you know, there, were, there was a review by the uh, uh, FISA court, who are just judges from other parts of the country, federal judges. Uh, they all concluded that it was legal, and it is. There is no serious case that it is a violation of the Constitution under current doctrine. You, you can change the law and say, we want to make it illegal, but that's, that's quite different. Now, you, you were going to remind me what your second question was. Second question, talk a little about this. I have some answers to you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure, but we got to go. Uh, you talk a little bit about what, what you Oh, yeah, what is the zone of privacy? Yeah, I, I, no, that's a, a reasonable expectation. A re you, you know, I. It's re I said it was like table manners. I think it kind of is. It, it evolves over time. You know, uh, answering the phone during dinner would have been impolite. Uh, and it's still not great to look at your phone, but if it's urgent, then you might. Uh, I, and, uh, um, and eating in front of the TV became acceptable uh, uh, table manners as a practical matter uh, around 1954. Um, and so it evolves. Um, I think we're in the process of watching the evolution of location information, which we mostly think of as, as private. Some people, and the, if you're as old as the Supreme Court justices, as soon I will be, uh, uh, they, uh, they really feel strongly about people not knowing where their location is. But we are raising a generation of children and grandchildren who their very first smartphone will have on an app that tells their parents where they are at all times. And, and, and if they're hanging out with their buddies, their buddies will have it too. Uh, and they will never grow up believing that the authorities don't know where they are. Uh, and so I just think there is change. Uh, and so you, it's almost impossible to write it into law. Uh, and I think it's dangerous to do so. Uh, and so you should look for other ways to punish people who violate our expectations. I agree with you. Flying drones onto somebody's property and looking in their window is out of bounds in my view. Uh, and I think you could reasonably argue that, that you know, uh, that's their property, right? You, 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 you're flying over their property and uh, notwithstanding the damage that commercial aviation has done to the idea that we all own everything up to the skies, uh, uh, we certainly own the, the, the next 300 feet. Uh, and that's a trespass and you could sue. You might be able to shoot the damn thing down. Okay. Yes. So reflecting on all the instances of privacy panics that you gave, uh, a, a few others came to mind for me. When you had the Pentagon Papers revealed, when you had the Chelsea Manning documents revealed, when you had Edward Snowden's documents revealed. The intelligence community We yeah, heard a lot panic. about how the sky is falling and all of these terrible things are going to happen to national security. And we've been far enough away from the Pentagon Papers to know that didn't happen. Even the Chelsea Manning documents didn't seem to be too much demonstrable harm, and we haven't seen any from the Edward Snowden documents yet. Should the government get used to the idea that they have less privacy, and aren't classification laws that even if you think those things are okay to classify, or you know, classify millions of documents that don't need to be classified, is that a privacy So panic? yes, I'd say yes and no I th I, 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 uh, about that. Uh, I do believe that we should use these technologies of mass data and oversight and uh, watching what people do online to take away first the privacy of the people who have access to our private information. They should be, they should know that every time they do a search on, on the name of an American or frankly any search in, in uh, these databases that it's going to be recorded and they could be asked later, why did you do that? Uh, and that that could be hooked up to a variety of other things that happened so that they can be punished for misusing that information, for sure. Uh, I, I, there is no percentage, if you're Mike Rogers or you're the, the second, the, the, the person who comes after the guy who suffers the breach, in dwelling on the losses. Uh, and so the practical political answer is you haven't heard about these losses uh, since then because there's no reason to dwell on those. It's dangerous if you say, oh my God, as is true, 
These guys exposed to ISIS, the, uh, uh, the guys who are leading the invasion of Iraq and the transformation of the Sunni areas of Iraq into a terrorist haven along with Syria. Uh, we were spying on those guys and we had, they were dumb enough to uh, think that if they drafted a Google Mail message and never sent it, that we wouldn't know about it. And so they just kept writing comments on a draft email and then putting it back in their uh, uh, email uh, and, and it never got sent. Uh, and thank you, Edward Snowden. We disclosed that in a New York Times article that said, by the way, ISIS, that's really stupid. Uh, I, I, I have no doubt that that helped. And we are now saying we're sending hundreds of troops in, in part, because we have no intelligence on ISIS. Uh, I don't know that there's a connection, and it would be dumb for the government to say, oh yeah, ISIS has gotten smart, and anybody else who's doing this, you should get smart too. So uh, there is a cost to, to laying out the cost. Uh, I, and so I, I'm not even convinced that you can say there were no losses from uh, the disclosure of the kinds of intelligence we were doing, gathering on how the Ho Chi Minh Trail was being used and where we were sending the bombers, which is part of the, uh, the mechanisms that were uh, disclosed in the Pentagon Papers. So I'm not completely convinced that there was no loss. Uh, uh, it's just that nobody has an incentive to disclose it, and there's a lot of reason not to disclose it. Uh, um, uh, so that's, that's the sh as close to a short answer as I can give you. Uh, we are about done, right? Can we take one more? One more. Yes. Great, thanks. Hi, uh, you expressed disagreement with certain things like the Google right to be forgotten or reg uh, regulations on the NSA's uh, data collection, um, which I would have a different perspective on. But I wanted to know from your perspective, do you see areas with all of the huge amount of information available where you think additional regulation is appropriate? Um, to protect consumers on privacy issues, either from government or private company use. Uh, so something that's not just moral panic, but something that you think would, would be appropriate. So I, I, I've given you one idea, which is access to that by government officials should be strictly and carefully watched. Where We're working with the technology because it's easier and easier to gather information about what people are doing with that. Uh, I'm, I think there's a similar argument to be made about uses of data, um, but you know this data is going to get collected. I mean, it's being collected now because it's practically free uh, a, a, to, to gather it, and they're gathering it thinking it's bound to be useful someday. Nobody even knows whether targeted advertising works, and we're still gathering this uh, because it's so cheap. Uh, I do think one question you need to ask is, what's the harm of having that information uh, in private hands? Sometimes there is. Uh, but it's remarkably seldom. You point to, oh, well, you might lose insurance. Well, I, we've sort of crossed that bridge with Obamacare anyway, so I'm not sure you can lose your insurance uh, over that, plus the, uh, the genomic uh, anti-discrimination review. So I guess I would say, let's figure out the bad things that can happen. Let's not try to ban the collection, which is not going to work anyway, uh, but ask how do we not want this information used and see if we can restrict that. Thank you so much. <laughs>